हेलो एंड वेलकम टू अनदर एपिसोड ऑफ द स्टूपिड हिस्ट्री पॉडकास्ट आई एम योर होस्ट टिन टिन टूडे वी विल टॉक अबाउट अ बैटल अ बैटल बिटवीन टू बिजनेस राइवल्स द इंग्लिश एंड द डच ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनीज येस यू हर्ड दैट राइट बिजनेस कंपिटिशन इन द एटीन सेंचुरी वॉज लिटरली कट थ्रोट द स्टोरी टूडे फीचर्स अ स्टेलर कास्ट by 18th century standards of course we have robert clive the east india company's governor in calcutta we also have mir jafar the nawab or ruler of bengal we have emperor shah alam the second the mughal emperor in delhi and he makes a couple of guest appearances and at the end of it all we have a stupid battle of gargantuan proportions stay tuned Our story starts in 1757 on the banks of the Bhagirathi River in a mango grove on a rain-swept summer day. It was 23rd June. Robert Clive and his East India Company army of only 3000 troops had just defeated the large force of Siraj ud Daula, the young upstart nawab of Bengal. This was in the Battle of Plassey. Clive's victory would not have been possible though if the nawab's commander in chief mir jafar and several other generals and nobles had not defected to the british side during the battle according to the secret agreement made before the battle in return clive would place mir jafar on the throne of bengal as the new nawab clive promptly placed mir jafar on the throne organizing a grand coronation on 2nd of july only 10 days after the battle for the first time in the history of the world the east india company a business enterprise whose only objective was to generate profit for its shareholders in england became king makers and in one of the richest provinces in india no less the result was only as expected mir jafar became a mere puppet under the protection of clive and the east india company meanwhile clive and other company employees went on a spree to consolidate their power and enrich themselves by taking whatever they could lay their hands on the company had absolute power without any responsibility by siding with clive at the battle of plassey mir jafar had hoped that the east india company would be grateful for his service and that they would go back to business as usual but soon he found himself gravely mistaken the company intentionally reduced the strength of his army to constantly remind him that he wouldn't be able to protect his kingdom without the support of the company's well trained forces This became clear in 1758 when Prince Ali Gohar the future Mughal emperor Shah Alam II invaded Bengal. Mir Jafar had to personally rush to Calcutta to beg Clive to help repel the attack. Clive happily agreed. The attack was repelled and company sent an invoice for the entire cost of the expedition to Mir Jafar. The nawab also found him impoverished after having to pay the East India Company a vast sum as indemnity for their losses in the war against Siraj ud Daula. Soon, Mir Jafar realized that he was under constant surveillance by Clive and his army of spies. By mid 1758, one year into his reign, Mir Jafar was already feeling suffocated. He had two options to escape from this situation. He could either strike up an alliance with his former enemy Prince Ali Gohar or he could reach out to the Dutch East India Company the other major european power in bengal at that time Mir Jafar calculated that although Prince Ali Gohar or the future Shah Alam II had a larger army than Clive it was not well equipped or trained enough to take on Clive's superbly trained East India Company's army Mir Jafar had observed the maneuvers and drills of Clive's army intently at Plassey and afterwards and he realized that only another well-trained European army could possibly defeat the English. In the mid 1700s there was a significant French and Dutch presence in Bengal. But then 3 months before the battle of Plassey in March 1757 Clive had strategically attacked and destroyed the French headquarters of Chandonagor near Calcutta. Because of this the Dutch were the only comparatively strong European power standing in 1758. So Mir Jafar opened secret negotiations with them with their headquarters in Chinsura which was about 20 miles up river from Calcutta. 
Although the Dutch and the British were allies in Europe, the Dutch East India Company jumped at this opportunity to remove their business competitors from Bengal. In clandestine meetings and letters, Mir Jafar promised his full support if the Dutch East India Company declared war against Clive's English East India Company. The Dutch had a problem, however. Unlike the privately run British East India Company, the Dutch company was directly controlled by the Dutch government. So they needed official authorization from the government to start a war against anyone, and especially the English, their allies in Europe. To seek permission, they would have to write to the Dutch governor in Batavia, present-day Jakarta in Indonesia, 2,500 miles away. Another problem was that the garrison at the Dutch settlement of Chinsura was much smaller than the British in Calcutta. So they also needed to bring in more troops from Jakarta if they were to stand a chance against the British. Despite his elaborate spy network in Bengal, Clive was somehow unaware of this plot. As more and more English troops arrived in Calcutta from England throughout 1758, Clive happily dispatched them to help the British fight the French in South India. If the Dutch had attacked Calcutta in 1758, they would have only met a weak resistance. Backed by Mir Jafar's cavalry, they would have easily overrun the city then. As Mir Jafar continued schmoozing Clive in Calcutta as a decoy throughout 1758 and much of 1759, the Dutch waited for a reply from their governor in Batavia. The reply finally arrived in June 1759. It was good news. Not only did the governor permit the Dutch in Chinsura to help Mir Jafar overthrow the British, he was also sending a strong fleet of seven warships carrying 700 Dutch regulars and 800 well-trained Malay troops to attack Calcutta. Mir Jafar must have been jumping with joy at this news. Deliverance and justice was now at hand. Finally. Finally, he would teach that arrogant Clive a lesson and send the British packing from Bengal. In October 1759, true to their promise, seven Dutch ships arrived at the mouth of Hooghly River, 30 miles south of Calcutta. Clive was stunned. He only had three small vessels at his disposal in Calcutta, and these were heavily outgunned. He tried to defuse this situation by writing a long letter to Mir Jafar, complaining about the Dutch. Mir Jafar, still schmoozing, pretended that he cared about this, setting off for Chinsura immediately, where he waited with his 150 cavalry to pounce upon Calcutta at the first opportunity. He replied to Clive though, and he said that all was well, and that he had vehemently rebuked the Dutch for bringing these ships into his kingdom. He also wrote that Dutch ships had promised to leave in January when the weather permitted. Now, Clive was an arrogant and a greedy man, but he was also a military genius. He read between the lines and Mir Jafar's role in the entire scheme of things became really clear to him. He therefore decided to take the Dutch by surprise. On 24th November 1759, he ordered his three small ships to go on a suicide mission. They were asked to open fire and destroy the much larger and better gunned Dutch fleet. The Dutch were so surprised by this unexpected attack that within few hours of fighting, all of the Dutch ships surrendered. The British ships were heavily damaged, but they prevailed because the Dutch had panicked and reacted slowly because they had to wait for the official protocol of getting orders approved through the chain of command. Clive also asked his subordinate, Colonel Ford, to march upriver and capture the small Dutch settlement of Boronogor, just north of Calcutta, and then mount an attack on Chinsura. Ford's forces reached an open field just outside Chinsura on the 24th of November and waited behind an old, overgrown Dutch defense ditch. At the same time, the combined Malay and Dutch force of about 2,000 soldiers marched 30 miles upriver from Howrah, a settlement on the opposite bank of Calcutta, and took their position on the other side of the overgrown ditch. On 24th November, Mir Jafar wrote two identical letters in which he individually promised his full support to both the British and the Dutch. Dampened by the news of defeat of the Dutch Navy by Clive's three ships, Mir Jafar did not want to take any chances. He wanted to end up on the winning side, come what may. 
The morning of the 25th of November dawned with a large, better trained Dutch and Malay force facing off against a smaller British East India Company army on the outskirts of Chinsura. Mir Jafar and his 150 cavalry waited at a distance on high ground, strategically not committing to any side. The battle opened with a deafening cannonade from both the sides. Then, Dutch infantry charged. As they closed in on the British, the first line of infantry came to a dead halt. They had not realized that there was an old, deep ditch in front of them. The communications between Chinsura and the incoming army from Batavia was so sloppy that no one had told them about the old, overgrown ditch that had been dug by the Dutch. There was confusion at the rear of the infantry. They did not understand why the charge had stopped and they were ordered to push from behind to make the front lines move on. The result? The front few lines of Malay infantry tumbled into the ditch and were killed or severely injured. For a brief moment, the British were stunned by this stupidity. They could not believe their eyes, but Ford soon came back to his senses and ordered his artillery and infantry to fire straight into the confused Dutch infantry. Then the British cavalry came around the ditch and cut through the Dutch lines, maiming and killing a number of troops. From a distance, Mir Jafar could see that his hopes were dashed. He quickly decided to join with the British, leading another cavalry charge on the already devastated Dutch army and forcing the Dutch to surrender. The battle was over within half an hour. With 320 Dutch and Malay soldiers killed and more than 300 wounded and 550 captured, not a single soldier was killed or wounded on the British side. Meanwhile, a week before the battle, Mir Jafar, certain of a Dutch victory, had asked his son Miran to march to Calcutta from his capital in Murshidabad with a large army. He was instructed to help the Dutch destroy Clive's army in Calcutta and force Clive to sign a humiliating treaty. As the Dutch navy was getting pulped on 24th November, Miran was just on the outskirts of Calcutta, happily unaware of the fate of the Dutch. When Miran arrived in Calcutta with his large force on the following morning, Clive had already won the battle. The Dutch power was on the way out from Bengal, and the English had made themselves even stronger. In response, Miran changed tax, sided with Clive, and advocated a harsh punishment for the Dutch. Mir Jafar was deposed the following year, not by Clive though, but by the next governor, Van Sittard. And all of this because there was a ditch that ditched the Dutch. Thank you very much everyone for listening. Do let me know what you thought about this episode. Subscribe to the Stupid History Podcast on Spotify or Podbean. You can also follow the Facebook page and YouTube channel of Heritage Walk Calcutta to listen to more such podcasts and watch videos and take part in our trivia. To support our research at this trying time of a global pandemic, please make a donation on patreon.com slash heritagewalkcalcutta. That is patreon.com forward slash heritagewalkcal. Thank you, stay home, stay safe, and keep smiling. I'll see you next week.